Okay, good afternoon everyone. I am very thankful for this opportunity to introduce our speaker for this week's Binalo Talks, who I got to know during the UGAT conference held in by Bay City Leyte last year. So, Ms. Melanie Narciso is a doctoral candidate of anthropology at the University of Georgia, Athens. She is a nutritionist by training with bachelor's and master's degrees from the University of the Philippines and University of Wisconsin. Prior to doing her doctoral studies, she was an assistant professor at the University of the Philippines at Los Baños, Laguna. She is an advocate of food and nutrition security and heritage conservation, studying and promoting this through biocultural diversity, ethnonutrition, taste, and memory. Currently, she, she is working on her dissertation that explores the cultural transmission of rice-based fermented traditions within the context of modernizing rice landscapes. In addition, her dissertation research that she will talk about today will make us think more about what happens to our food from their acquisition in the landscape and, well, seascape, through their preparation and their consumption until their discard, as well as their implications in the archaeological record and narrative after. In this case, we will think about rice beyond its domestication and spread histories that we usually talk about in archaeology, where we will follow its social life that consists of a continuum with a series of stages from its production to its discard. In these stages, rice and associated materials have different intertwined relationships with people. These stages are archaeologically traceable, especially the stage when rice and associated artifacts are being used by the people for their everyday living, allowing us to evaluate the whole chain of repertoire or operational sequence and the cultural biography of rice and relevant artifacts. This can lead us to understand the daily lives of past communities in the Philippines and Southeast Asia, where rice is very important. So without further much ado, please welcome Miss Melanie Narciso. Thank you so much, Dr. Eusebio, for the very kind introduction. Now, before I go any further, is uh, am I okay? Can you hear me well, everybody? Okay? Yes, uh, yes, we can fine? hear you. Great, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I would like to add to that a uh, long introduction that I love talking about food, so beware, somebody has to be really timing this talk. <laughs> and uh, just to um, say, say a bit more about uh, Dr. Michelle Yusebio's introduction, while uh, the focus she mentioned was on rice, um, I tweak it a bit so that it will be a little bit more exciting, but of course rice will certainly be there. Okay. And of course, thank you so much for inviting me and thank you so much for all those who came, family, friends. And it's a powerhouse today. I've seen uh, earlier people, experts from nutrition, food science, culinary arts, heritage, ecology. What else did I forget? Oh, let's see. Biology, of course, fermentation experts. And I have my former students here, so this is really very nice. And I also have heard that some professors have invited their students here, professor, um, students of archaeology or science, technology, society, um, nutrition, and food science from UP and UP Los Banos and Diliman. So thank you all for coming. Now, let's get to work. Everybody's going to work. <laughs> we will have some uh, conversations later, I'm sure, that are really very interesting because of this powerhouse of guests or participants. So let me start uh, sharing my screen. Oops, let's see. Where is it? There you are. Okay. Oh, uh, is it showing on a slideshow mode? No, not. Um, there it is. There. There. Okay, great. So, all right, the first thing I want us to do is to understand our, uh, to understand the frame or the, the lens that I'm looking at food is, what do you feel, see, think when you see this picture? Uh, and it's okay to shout out what, what you feel right now. Anybody? Not hearing anybody. Masarap. <laughs> Masarap. Okay, anybody else? Hello, sour. 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 Okay. Anything else? That's it? 
Okay, I think I'm seeing some chat. Uh, okay, I'm not so good at looking at everything. Okay, Bagoong somebody is sarkaya. somebody's drooling. Yes. Okay. Bagoong. Okay. Okay. Let's go to the next one. All right. How about that? What do you have in mind? What do you feel? What do you see? Masarap. Masarap. What else? Baho, Baho. Baho. Okay. Okay. Anything else? What does it about? First trip to Jensan. Okay, we are seeing more than basic taste or sensory experiences here, right? So we are seeing places, putok batok. You know what I'm seeing here or what I'm hearing? I'm hearing my office mates in, in nutrition at UP Los Banos giggling because they've been hiding durian from each other. And one of them was actually really, I could see her vivid in my mind. She was covering her nose because she didn't like it. Okay, now for those people who didn't have anything that, uh, um, anything evoked in their mind after hearing all these stories, I'll just share one more story. Okay, I have this friend in anthropology. Um, she's from the U.S. Um, he's an, an anthrop archaeologist from the U.S. And uh, one time he was teaching his students. These are grade one students. Oh, no, not teaching. He was in a party. He was invited to a birthday party. And you know what happened when he was eating? He suddenly cried weeping why because he was eating something and then the food reminded him of a friend a friend who was lost and um the food just reminded of him i think maybe he was cooking the dish for him or what but how evocative isn't it and that's my first point and that's of one of the sp smaller parts of the framework i'm working on food evokes sensations and memory and it did, did seem to be obvious among many of us here. Okay. This is a point that I also draw from food and memory expert and leader, Dr. David Sutton, which also actually has to um, has so much to also, uh, or it has a lot uh, of, uh, what do you call this? Um, if you're going to look at the landscape theory, they, they actually have so much in common. So food, landscape, or actually food can be considered part a, a landscape. If you're going to look at it uh, at a lens uh, of Sobal et al. from Cornell, they look at it as, well, they can look at food as in the level of kitchenscapes, tablescapes, platescapes, and foodscapes. So they evoke a lot of memory because there, there are a lot of features in it. There are a lot of material properties that make it memorable. And if you did not remember anything a while ago or didn't sense anything, it's because maybe you just didn't really have the memory to give you a horizon to sense things, right? Okay, so this is part of my framework. And okay, what do you think? If the landscape changes, if people in the landscape change, don't you think there will be also changes in the senses or memory? I mean, if, if that is actually what we are seeing now i mean uh, based on your based on what you said maybe there go, there are going to be changes right and these sensory transitions are not or have been articulated by some archaeologists or sorry by anthropologists and one of these persons is dr nadja serimetakis and um, she has actually mentioned specifically how when things change or when modernity happens, there is what you call the sensitization. Yes. Okay, as I was saying a while ago, okay, uh, as the landscape changes, the senses also change. And one of the arguments made here is when there is modernity happening, and actually that is happening a lot, we are desensitized and what is or how is this happening and let's think about this it will be nice to think about this prior to getting into the into the bulk or meat of the talk so dr nadja sarimetaki says because material culture is fleeting it it, it has we have we have this faster turnover think of it this way your cell phones like how how soon do you change it right i mean very fast and uh, what is the implication of this? She says that there is shortened exposure to the material. And what does that mean? We have lesser engagement with it. And so we don't get to remember things. We don't get to know it. 
And thinking about it in a food level, I think about, for example, rice. When you buy new rice, sometimes you ask the, the retailer or maybe your mom, oh, how much rice do you have to put in here, right? So, oh, sorry, how much water do you have to put in here when you cook? So this is just a basic example, but we don't have really much of this information because we have less exposure to the material. And what is the implication if we lose this senses or we lose this knowledge? Probably we will lose some of these culinary traditions that I'm interested in or what we're going to talk about. How else does modernity desensitize? There is this word, big word, hyperesthetization, always hard to pronounce, forwarded by David Hulse. He talks about the stimuli, hyper sensory stimuli around us because of modernity. Think about supermarkets. When you go shopping, before it's just food products, probably in the, in the shelves, but now what do we have? Maybe music playing, samples, etc. all these experiences. And maybe you have experienced immersive dining where some have this theater productions going on while eating, and then there are also have you seen those with all this background music, background visuals, and even some race to the sky, even the piano, etc. Very sensory, uh, hypersensory rather. And what are the implications of this? Well, some authors say this is causing us to lack or lose the sense of what is real. In food talk, I'm interpreting this as maybe we will not taste, we will have to have good discernment. Okay, what, what, what tastes what? How is it different from each other? And I think that is important. And we can talk more about implications of this as we move along the discussion. Okay, it's not moving. There you go. Now, so this is the frame or framework how I am actually talking about the palette. And for those people who do not talk about the palate in a different way, so maybe you're thinking about the palate, the roof, roof of the mouth. I'm talking about another thing. I'm talking about our appreciation for taste or our taste, basically, preferences, for example. Uh, for Filipinos, maybe we can uh, say panlasa, or I don't know in Kapampangan, if uh, our experts here on Kapampangan could, could uh, tech, type that in the chat box, that would be great. Okay, so I am fortunate to be able to um, study this because I am doing this uh, doctoral dissertation on something that can be observed over a long time. I am doing my doctoral dissertation on the cultural transmission of buro or fermented rice and fish. And this is actually a really great thing to, to, to study. For, for our palate because buro is very loaded with flavor, very much loaded with flavor. And buro is being a mainstay of our Pampanga food culture. I am from Pampanga. It is there to stay, well, at least for now. I, I mean, I could see still a longer future for it and we can still observe it. Okay, my, my, my doctoral dissertation actually studies the trajectories of three things, rice, buro, and the senses, how they are co-evolving, how, how they are intersecting, so how they are keeping each other. Okay, now for the uninitiated, probably some of you have, are attending because you are attracted to buro itself. Uh, this thing here that I'm pointing at, this is buro. This is a fermented fish fermented fish product so it is made normally with rice fish salt and then this one is cooked further with tomatoes onions garlic sauteing it in oil okay and normally we eat it all together like if you think of some you know some gypsal i'm sure so it, it's similar to that and uh, some kandaba people say na una kami sa kanila no people who are eating some gypsal okay now because I'm studying buro, this led me to Kandaba, Pampanga, which is associated so much, very popular for making buro. Okay, so let's start digging deeper. Okay, 
So I've been here or in, in Tandaba for a year now, started in September, and I'll be staying for a couple more months, uh, slowed down by the pandemic. And uh, so for those who are not so familiar with the place, so this is in, of course, Pampanga. Pampanga is in the northern island of Luzon, and probably what you have heard of Pampanga is it is a culinary center of the Philippines. Of course, this has a lot of issues in it, but let's not talk about that. And what is unique about Candaba is its swamp. It becomes a swamp during the rainy season. If you could see the map and then see the pink spots there, those are the spots that really get so flooded. It becomes an ocean there, literally, during the wet season. Because if you could see the blue marks here, the rivers, these are swelling during the rainy seasons and meeting each other. This is a catch basin, so all the water from the different provinces uh, get here. Then it takes a while before it subsides. And so uh, it means that fishing is a predominant um, occupation there as, lo uh, as well as rice. So during the summer or during the dry seasons, it's more of uh, farming. Recently, a lot of rice farming. Okay. So they have a lot of fish there whenever there are, there's flood. So that is, that is how they explain that's why they have burro because there's so much fish and being the Filipinos that they are, we don't like waste, ayaw natin ang sayang. So they preserve it using that method. Now let's go to my reconstruction of the history or biography of burro. And we will discuss this in two, two parts. First, let's talk about the fermentation because it is first fermented. And I have included in this timeline the different events that I feel have uh, made their mark on the material aspect or the material um, dimensions of buro. Okay, so buro has been made by the households just for household use until the time, well, up to now. And then later on with the World War II over, people have to be, you know, pick up from where they were or um, they have to have livelihood. One person started buru making for commercial purposes and other people imitated. And so there came the, the industry of commercial buru making. Now, what are the implications? I feel that the commercialization has a lot of implications for buru making because this is not just affecting the commercial producers, but also the other people oh, who are making it for household use because they are influencing them into or teaching them how to make it. So one of which is the addition of celestre to buro, okay, or salitre, that's how we know it more, and the, to preserve the fish. You could imagine why they add it because uh, they get a lot of fish and then they don't have refrigerators. They cannot, uh, the fish would get stale. They have to somehow make it look better. So they add that because they're going to sell it. And then, yep, so it has actually in, um, been incorporated in recipes of other household bakers. Okay, and then another thing that I feel like commercial production has introduced is a two-step two fermentation process. Okay, let me then show you how they make buro. And this is more of a one-step process. You have to clean the fish. It has to be really super clean. Superlatives are always heard when they talk about it. Dapat matik-tik, dapat malinis. It's super clean, super drained. And they, they have to remove the blood because if the blood is still there, it, it will turn out bad smelling, etc. So they use hollow blocks, um, brushes, toothbrush to remove the blood and wash it a lot. And then sometimes people would add, uh, would soak this in salt or they would just mix it with salt and rice as, uh, okay, this lady is not mixing it with salt anymore because she has already uh, soaked it in salt water. Now she is piling everything, uh, layers of rice in the container. In, in this case, she is using big fish, bulig or what we know as the lag or mudfish. And because it's big, she would be putting the rice in between, like sandwiching it. If there are smaller fishes than this, they would sandwich rice like this way. So, uh, and then if it's a lot more small fish, they would just mix it with the rice. Okay. 
So she would keep on doing that until the jar or the container is full. It used to be that they used jars for this one. Okay, let's go to the last part of this. So she would fill it to this point, and you would see that it's covered to, um, to encourage the fermentation, which is more of uh, an aerobic one to encourage lactic acid bacteria. And uh, you would see that there's a base in here to catch the whatever, whatever liquid is coming out of the burro. All right, so that is an example of a first or one-step fermentation. Now, the two-step one is similar, except, okay, they combine rice, salt, fish, but then it, this time it is more salt, less rice. What is the implication of this? Uh, we know that lactic acid bacteria cannot tolerate a lot of the salt. So fermentation, lactic, lactic acid bacteria fermentation may not really happen as much as in the first one. And so this one um, somehow dehydrates the fish, keep, keeps the salt inside, keeps for a month to a year. And then they would add the rice and then ferment it for three days. Note the difference. The one step one, they would ferment it for about four or less seven days. This depends on the temperature, on the salt added. And then the other one is three days. It's shortened this in the fermentation. Now note, the, the rice used for the, for the second edition is a different rice. Okay, because they, they, want, they want the softer one for this function so that it will ferment faster. And I, I feel like this is more of an influence of modern rice introduction. Okay. Modern rice varieties have been introduced in the 1970s. And this actually have given them more options in terms of you know, rice that they could use for cooking. And the modern rice varieties, they normally see as the bangnasin type of rice. Mabangnas, meaning you know, body odor, you know, if rice spoils, you know, that smell, sometimes you smell, you think that's the similar smell that you get from other people when they're profusely sweating. Okay, so yes, so I'm guessing that is one of the possible reasons why the two-step process was done and then it has been adopted by other people. Now, what are the other changes and what are the other events that happen? Fish has become lesser and lesser, and this is not a new story. And there has been the introduction of fish ponds in the 1990s. So because uh, there is less fish, they have promoted this more. Some people felt that this is more profitable than rice farming. And so there is more fish, but more in the sense of more of the aquaculture fish, and then less of the swamp fish. And to me, this, this uh, seems to introduce a lighter type of burro because if you have the swamp fish, there's more fish before, it's going to be darker. And note that um, a large part of their, like since 1970s, they are get getting the NFA rice because this is the cheaper rice. And this is darker and it also makes the burro dark. Okay, so recently there is less fish and then the, the fish from the fish, uh, fish ponds are expensive. So the burro may be lighter than before. Now, what does this tell us or what, okay, let us first talk about what people or how do people see their burro, okay? If you ask them, of course, they, they do notice a lot of things of their burro, but very prominent in the discourse is the color. Ideally, it should be white because dark or matuling evokes a lot of things. NFA rice, their history of it, which is, they, they don't like the NFA rice because it's mabaho and uh, mabulok and uh, it has, it's not of good quality. It's unclean. Well, if you don't uh, prepare the burro well, so it's going to be unclean and it re reflects also the, the habits of the person preparing it. And then dark means marukat or ugly. And this is not new to us Filipinos because we always look up to white as good. Okay, think about the uh, white beaches, for example, just kidding. Um, um, here, for example, they, they are fond of uh, white or um, lighter skinned women and so on and so forth. Smell, they don't like any smell from the burro. To people who are used to smelling fermentation, fermented products, this is something that we, we normally smell something, right? And for them, bad smell evokes stinky hands or mabulok na gamat. There are 
people who are thought not successful in fermenting because they touched their poop when they were young and so they carried it this on up to adulthood they cannot make good buro and again bad smell means unclean fish or un unclean persons stale fish and that lingering smell on the fingers is really very uh it's not something that they like so if if so because they 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 eat with their fingers okay so if the smell stays there it stays sometimes for a week and they don't like it what is my sense of the palate from these observations of both the material and as well as the what they cognize from this well we know that it's not just a basic sensory thing here that's going on the basic sensory things may also indicate gauges of safety, security, freedom from their dark past like inferior rights and the burro stigma. And whiteness and absence of smell have been normalized already actually because they have this function for them. Okay? And I feel there is this signals anosmia. Anosmia means the lack of smell. It's not that they cannot smell but it's more of they do not have the taste for or the smell for the fermented products anymore which again goes back to what we were talking about earlier about modernity as possibly desensitizing our taste note that some evolutionary biologists are talking about the story of the taste story of our taste as a story of a loss of taste is that true well these are things that we still have to figure out but at least if this trajectory continues this um, lack of preference for the traditional fermented foods that are fermented longer what are the implications to the food culture there could be shorter or even unfermented products think about puto it was fermented before it's not fermented anymore it's a totally different product think about sushi sushi was fermented before but after years of shortening the fermentation period they just add vinegar now and it became a different product Food and nutrition security wise, this is an issue because if there is lesser lactic acid bacteria there or okay, say seven days is the normal fermentation process and you shorten this to three days more or less, the succession of the microorganisms, all the processes happening, all the products coming out there, we won't get all those and of course the benefits we won't also get we always talk about fermented foods as really very beneficial but maybe not all fermented foods are the same i mean for example burro they're not the same let's talk about the biography of burro this time it um in its cooking process okay so no please note by the way that the these things that i'm presenting to you came from a lot of interviews survey the interviews uh, come in different ways life history interviews okay exploratory interviews and semi-structured interviews and participatory observation okay you remember that picture i showed you earlier about uh, of the burro it has the tomatoes the ginger uh, the the onion in it etc this is what prevails this is what you would see normally when when you see people serving it in Kandaba and even in the rest of Pampanga. But you know what? I've always known that it, it, it was that way. But you know, earlier, before the 1970s, it has been served raw. They just top it on rice. They don't cook it. Okay? And then after that, since the 1970s, oil, garlic, onion has been added. And then 1980s, tomatoes, ginger, vetsin, 2000, we are seeing more of this addition of magic syrup nor cubes tomato paste uh okay of course to nutritionists this may sound alarm alarm already because uh it is already very salty to start with burro especially the ones that is, the ones that are produced with the two-step fermentation okay um what explains this 1970s was the time when they started with a lot of the rice farming and probably that was the time when more of these people have graduated from school. They still have a lot of people who are not professionals there. They have more money, not so much, but at least some more money to, to buy this stuff. And then more money even probably in the 1980s. 
And then 2000, maybe not so much money. I mean, the other thing that possibly happened is just like what Nutrition Transition Discourse talks about, some flavorings, some foods have become cheap. For example, there's this lady who talks about she would rather buy tomatoes to, to make her burro. Oh, sorry. She would rather buy tomato paste instead of tomatoes because it's cheaper to use tomato paste. So it may be similar for the others. But you know what else I am seeing here? Okay. It is... Okay. So they put all this together okay, because it's good. It makes them happy. It is giving them more appetite to eat. Especially this is important in a landscape with, where they have to work so hard because it's a hard labor doing rice farming and other work like construction, etc., which is a predominant um, occupation too. Okay, it makes them eat more. Okay, and, and the food there is more bland. So if you consider the fish coming from the swamp, a lot of the, this is fresh water fish, this is bland. Okay. Now, another way of looking at it is there's this building up. So note that these things that have been added through the years have stayed on, except for those last ones, the recent additions like Magic Sarap, etc. Uh, this have not really been stabilized yet. A lot, not a lot are doing that yet, but there are a number. Okay, so there is a building up here of flavors. Okay, so... I look at this as a way for people to, okay, so this is something that will help us understand it. For, for, people to, for people to be happy or what they aspire to have there is to have a big house, to have a car, to have a diploma, because it's a very, very difficult life there. But of course, not everybody can do that. Up to now, a lot are not professionals there. And a lot of a lot do not have big houses. What can they do? Do what you know what they can do with what whatever small they have, and they can do this through food, do other things too, like dresses, etc. They they love dressing up, makeup, etc. Now they are building up in a smaller scale, and this helps in overcoming oppression, like the oppression of being poor. Okay, and this reminds me of um, what. Um, Tausig says about mimetic excess, so when you want to overcome your oppression, you're doing something more than like what other people are doing. It's exaggerated. So maybe, that, maybe this exaggeration of flavor is, is similar to what he's saying. And then ostentation. You heard probably of the Kapampangan stereotype, their mayabang. Or we are mayabang. Okay? I, of course, I don't want to talk any further about that because uh, we were running out of time, but maybe in the Q&A we could with Kapampangan experts here. But yeah, I mean, people are after distinction, as uh, Bourdieu would, would say. And so this is a way to make them different, especially, you know what I always hear there, because Kandaba is composed of Kapampangan and Tagalog regions. So there will always be uh, uh, like people saying they're different from the Tagalogs. Okay? They're, they're better in terms of hospitality. And we can also look at it at the Kapampangan level. They do not like, uh, what do you call this? They, there is this notion that Kapampangans are great cooks. So they're living up to that reputation. Okay, they're really good cooks. They, want, um, they really take pride when, when their friends say that they're better cooks among all the other Kapampangans. And I would say this is also what we call heritageization. I always have a difficult time saying that. It's about, you know, okay, they have this heritage. They, once, once people actually know that they have this heritage, they legalize it, institutionalize it, they try to do more. I mean, this buro is already there, right? So you don't have to do more. You already have buro. It's your heritage. But in their case, they build on it, okay? And so these are the things I'm seeing. And it gives a sense of satiety, progress, triumph, distinction. And because this helps them in feeling better, this helps them in, make them in making themselves feeling better, this became embodied through time. And uh, though, of course, the recent additions are not so embodied yet. When I say embodied, think of it this way. Okay, there are some, some of these uh, people who I, I hear saying, oh, okay, maybe I could show you this instead. 
second paragraph. Mas malasa ing pamangan ni keng kanda ba kaya sa keng aliwang lugar. Ot e man yaman ing lutu da, matabang ing ulam da. Food in kanda ba is more flavorful than other places. Why is the food in other places not good? It's it's bland. I hope I translated that well. Okay, it has been embodied already. So they are already. They have. That's already their palate. Okay. Which is a signal of hyperesthetization for me, or maybe we're going there, or maybe we're there already. It's a hypersensory environment, food environment that we have, which have implications to the food culture. We can expect more complex buru cooking. It can make another new dish after all. Thinking about speciation here, right? And then in in terms of food and nutrition security, it could increase the food intake normally. When you put more flavors in, it would increase the intake, increase the sodium intake, especially if it's the condiments that you add, which is not good if, oh, well, considering we already have high levels of sodium in our diet, and the lack of appreciation of other food. Think about that example a while ago of people not appreciating the food from other cultures or other kapampanans, right? So take-home messages here is, are material changes in our food get to us. If you change something in the culture, it's not inert. There will be something that we will embody. Okay? We sense food differently and this can be good or bad. It, and, and we don't just sense salty, sour, bitter, and sweet. There's more to that. In the case of Kandaba, they help um, in, in keeping their sense of safety, security, identity, or the flavors give a sense of satiety, progress, triumph, and distinction. The reduced taste for traditionally fermented buro and the building up of flavors may have food culture and food security consequences. But of course, this needs a lot more confirmation and I'm still in the field, so that's good. And uh, we could still talk about this and I could, of course, uh, with your help, could still develop these thoughts. And while I'm on this, maybe you can also think about it. How about you? What is your sense of your palate? And I leave you with that. Thank you. This is, by the way, funded by the NSF, National Science Foundation, and the Southeast Asian Regional Center for Graduate Study, CIRCA. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Melanie Narcisa. That was a very inspiring talk. And also, I guess that there's a lot of people who are also hungry. So it's very timely that this, is, uh, this talk is happening after lunch. I think there's some questions now. Um, We'll start with Miss uh, Marilyn Balolo. I think she already left because she had a class, but she gave a question uh, for everyone. Uh, it's very interesting to discover the microbiome or microbial community responsible for the fermentation and flavor development as we vary the rice varieties used in Buro. So exciting work that we can do together or do you already have data for this in your dissertation? Okay, uh, the, the fermentation process or the, the science or the, and even the, the flavors, I wanted to do that and so it was very hard for me to, to, <laughs> to settle with the, what proposal to do for my dissertation. But I cannot do that with the timeline. So it's something that I'm preparing for. So, but at the moment, what I'm just doing is measuring the, the flavor, uh, rather measuring some basic flavors but I haven't done that yet because of the COVID happened. And this is not so much to, to, to give a good description or, or like the differences of buro prepared different ways, but more to have anchors. Because when we talk about food, we lack vocabulary. So it's just for mm -hmm. me to understand, oh, when they're saying, when they're talking about manyaman, what does that mean? Delicious, what does that mean? But that is the next thing in the agenda. Okay, uh, so maybe this is something that you can think about in the future, or uh, or are you thinking about uh, eventually after your dissertation, you're going to go into the processes or the, the the analysis of the microbes, or 
Thanks yes, and on. actually, the person who the person who asked that we are we have yeah. always been talking about collaborations. So <laughs> that is certainly what we're so. thinking about doing. So I'm just leading the way. I mean, we know very well that we cannot just well. This is something I learned when I got into anthropology that it is always nice to do the groundwork, stay in the field, do your ethnography, because that's the only time that we, you learn like what things do we really have to measure. Yes. Okay. That's true. How do we and, intervene? So, yeah. Yeah. And there, there are some things that you can always have to tweak when you're already in the field, I suppose. Right. Right. Um, we have a question from Timothy J. TJ Dimakali. Can I ask you to unmute, please? Um, uh, because he raised his hand. TJ? Oh, I, I think he... He is not online so we'll we'll wait for him uh there's another question in the talks from franco ah uh franco rondin uh you mentioned earlier that one step fermentation requires certain temperatures so do they use this method during certain seasons Probably before they only use it during the hold on. Are you talking about one? Well, yeah, one step. Probably before they just did this during the rainy season when they had so much fish. Mm -hmm. But you know they don't really have to wait for like so much uh, like for the flood to really get so high because they say like even with just little flood they can get fish anyway. So it's not impossible they're doing this. A lot more frequently than we think but nowadays but nowadays uh, there the people who are normally just getting the fish from the like from the rivers etc they do less of it so more of those people who are making buro are those who are just you know selling because fish is more expensive there are less lesser fish in the swamp so yeah, so a lot of people said that they don't do a lot of uh, buro making anymore because there's not not enough fish. They would just rather eat it as buy-in. All right, um, so it makes sense. Um, TJ Dimakali uh, posted his question. So the rise of buro mass production post World War II. Uh, what factors might have spurred this? And this is just a matter of enterprising people trying to pick up after the war, or might there be more to it than that? It's a very historical mm -hmm. question. So, mm -hmm. to be honest, I don't really know a lot yet about this, okay, because I'm still digging in. But then, it's not like it's a lot. Because the discourse is, it's only recently that people really started to learn it. So before, it was more of like there were, there are gifted people. The discourse was there were more gifted people. Uh, they don't have stinky hands. Remember that story about like the person touching the poop and then they, they just happen to have stinky hands all their life and they can't make buro anymore. Mabuluk na gamat. Okay, so before it was more of this gifted people making the buro. Then later on, because people recognized that it was good business and probably... Uh, I don't, I cannot pinpoint exactly what year that was when they started to, they just started imitating these buro makers. This is just recent. So after World War II, it's not that there was suddenly this, you know, a lot of these people making buro. People say, are saying there are a couple of buro makers, but it's not like, you know, barangays are like full of experts making buro. But of course, quantity wise, it's so hard to quantify it. It's really very hard to quantify it, and especially when you go to a community. Uh, um, the 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 problem that I have in 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 doing my research here is when I when I was looking for the cultural experts, they would always say, "Ah, mga matenala." It means they all died already. <laughs> so I'm fighting against time, and, and in fact, some of the survey participants I have, those uh, belonging to the older generations, have already passed since I started here, which is really sad. How many years have you been working on this research, if I may ask? Oh, um, just last September when I started doing the field work. Supposed okay. to be done already, slowed down by the pandemic. All right. But you've already been uh, working previously on the other fermentation types? or? Uh, no, no, no. Well, I've been working on rice before, but rice. not fermented rice. So, oh, okay. Yeah, this is new territory. But I've always been interested in fermented foods. Yes. Um, 
Okay, uh, I guess I, I will go ahead because um, I have a question just top of my mind. But are people, are there still some people who are using the jars for, for the fermentation process? Or? Unfortunately, no, they're uh -huh. not there. So it's really very sad. And that's one thing that should also be studied. Um, they, okay, they have those tapayan before. And actually, that's, that's what they say is the basis for uh, where the town got its name. No? They're called Daba. Okay. And, and they, oh, anyway. And then um, they are not using them anymore because maybe they're not available anymore. I don't really see them. And plastic is really very cheap, cheaper than those. And yep, you could see them using those, you know, those boxes. Um, I hate to say the brand, but that's the only brand I remember. Orokan boxes, those where you put all the stuff. Yes. Right. So normally they use those different sizes of those plastic boxes, which uh, I think has some science affecting the burong making as well. But at this point, I cannot answer questions okay. on those. All right. So um, it would be interesting to see if there's also, besides the, sa uh, the science, and therefore the taste uh, and the memories that it evokes might also be changing based on the right. materials that they were using right, right. For, for, mm -hmm. for fermenting. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, oh, I want to add something, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, because it floods a lot in Tandaba, right? Maybe those are really hard to keep. Because you know what, the, the tapayan, you know what happens when it floods. Okay, the houses are somewhat like skeleton. Well, I'm not a good architecture person. They're kind of stilts on the first floor. So stilt houses. Then, okay. mm, but then they're but, concrete now. Uh -huh, a lot yeah. of concrete now. Yes. And when it rains really hard uh, and there's a lot of water, so they have to elevate a lot of things inside the house because it even gets to the second floor. So they have to put, so they have to make, put like planks and then put things over it. Uh, it may not work if with the bayans. Maybe plastic is better in that in that regard. Okay, that uh, makes sense. Hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, actually, I want to ask more questions, but there's a lot of questions coming in from Nico Veneracion. Uh, how does Buro figure in the mealscape of those in Kandaba? Like, how is it situated within a usual meal? Okay. Especially with their other significant culinary items or processes or rituals. That's a very, question. that's a great question. Yes. So, kandaba is, oh, sure, sorry. Buro is normally eaten as a condiment. Okay. But it has a lot of personalities. It, 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 it changes it on its ontology depending on who is eating it, what uh, socioeconomic uh, background he's coming from, etc. For example, okay. Buro is has been a famine food. It, when they don't have when they don't have anything to eat, that could be their ulam or the viand. Okay, and I heard this also being eaten during the pandemic because there's no food. No. And yeah, yeah. And then uh, some people just buy buro, for example, and then keep on adding rice. I, this reminds me of this story of this girl who has a magic magical pot. You know that story, like the, there's just like food coming from it all the time. And yeah, buro can work that way. I mean, it can just keep on fermenting, right? Okay, so that's one story. Another story is for a lot of uh, the people, this is a special occasion food as well. So in fiestas, you would see it. And because especially when they're expecting people from Manila, they say sabik ang mga taga Manila sa buro and you would know who the Manilenos are because because there is so sabik but then people from Kandaba are not less sabik anyway because there are also people who say oh they, yeah they're wondering like even if they have it anyway always they're still eating a lot of it okay and then but but it's not just but not all special occasions you would see buro eating they would not serve it in a wedding. They would not serve it in, let's see, Chris, at Christmas time. Christmas time is spaghetti, hamon, fruit salad, and bread and sandwich bread. Okay, that's but that's not a Christmas food. Yes, yeah, sorry. In fiestas or in uh, yes, fiestas they uh, do. But how about not in not mm -hmm. funeral or weeks? Of uh, that one, I have not encountered i have not encountered it yet so i'm not so sure about that but normally when there's like this when it's 
catered when it's like bonga ah, yeah okay they don't because they say masam um, it will just lose because there's a lot of other food items especially um one of the things that i also wanted to share but couldn't share anymore there's this of course changing aesthetic to what is good for special occasions it used to be that for example caldereta was you know, special, you know, just like when Doreen Fernandez said that this tomato sauce based dishes have been the like, you know, the, the colonial uh, remains of Spanish um, colonization are the special occasion foods and then the Chinese et cetera, food, etc. are the pang aldoldo or the foods for the, you know, ordinary days. But now caldereta is different. I mean, it's not anymore the thing. Now it's, uh, what, it, what do you call it? Mm. Not samji. Uh, I can't recall. It's a dish with oyster sauce. Dishes with oyster sauce are the big thing now. Okay, anyway, but I think I'm quite um, deviating. But I'm just saying that it, it's changing. It's changing. And, and in terms of the meal, in terms of the meal, it is also, other than being a condiment, it's now a pulutan as well. Pulutan with gulai, vegetables. Is there a fermentation that for drinks in Kandaba? That is for Kapampangan? Uh, in Kandaba, there's none that I know of. Uh, I mm -hmm. heard I heard somebody said, uh, I think it was Lilian Borromeo, a Pampango food expert, who said something about a fermented alcohol there. But this, I never really, I never really saw. I never really heard it from the elders that i've been talking to so when they when they pair uh when they use buro as pulutan mm -hmm. uh is it for beer or tandua uh, rum it could be it could be it, it could be beer red horse normally is the preference okay. and then for other hard drinks as well so it's not it's not choosing i don't I don't. I haven't heard them like saying a specific drink for it. But okay. but but I, I was okay. wondering that. But but one thing that we should uh, note is, buro is eaten with pinak or it's swamp fish because it's bland. You don't eat it with bangus. You don't eat it with other um, saltier or uh, non freshwater fish. Okay. All right. Hmm. Interesting. Um. For Mark Reblora has a question. So during fermentation, ano yung chemical, what's the chemical reaction na nangyayari kaya nagproduce yung certain flavor ng buro? At ano po yung nangyayari or something sa buro na kapag kinain ng buro with other food dishes ay mas na-enhance yung flavor ng mga dishes at nakakapagpabigay ng gana lalo kapag kumain? Okay. That's a difficult question to answer. Uh, to, uh, I mean, in, the, in a more accurate, if we're talking about an accurate manner of the, um, answering it, okay? Uh, because there are so many factors coming in. Okay, but, but generally what happens is, okay, there is, okay, rice would have this starch, right? And then um, it will actually be converted, okay? There will be lactic acid, and then the acid will hydrolyze the proteins, it's complex proteins that we have from the fish or shrimp or whatever we're using. And so these proteins will be broken down. And depending on the fish that you will use, it will be different profiles of uh, different flavor compounds that you could get. Okay, for example, you can have glutamate. Okay, all these different amino acids. Okay, so, um, but yeah, there are so many factors. There are really so many factors I couldn't say accurately. And unfortunately, we don't have, um, I don't, I haven't encountered studies on this yet. Studies have always been on the succession, not much on the flavor compounds. And, at, um, and the Dr. Balolong who was here with us earlier did study about the antimicrobial properties that it has, but not the flavor compounds. And this is an invitation to, to do work here because there's just a lot of work we could do even together of course that's better i'm sure there's a lot of people who are actually very interested and this is an interesting concept about the what type of food that the the people were using in the past how how has it changed because there's all you touched on the concept of uh, changing food but the palate also it, it there's some probably some resistance 
uh, but there's also negotiation. So I, I really uh, interest. I'm really interested in that. Um, mm -hmm. James Esguera, James Paul Esguera asked. I, uh, he has two questions. So manufacturing processes considerations and how it may relate to the microbiome. I know two things. They are using plastic containers of about four gallons, very thin. So during World War II, were they using tap tapayan, tapuayan, or clay jars? So I guess you already answered that. Mm -hmm. And I note that your timeline is about eight decades. I am guessing if there are changes in environmental conditions or increased amp like increased ambient temperature, say two Celsius less, pinatubo effect of 0 0.5 Celsius, uh, increased climate extremes, more how, how when hot, more dry when dry, more, more hot when hot, more dry when dry, more wet during rainy season. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's also the swelling of the Kandama swamp associated with the sediment deposition from Pinatubo compared to the prior deposit that may have been used as material for Tapayan. So how might this have affected the quality of the product? Uh, let's answer number two. And Yes, temperature really has an effect on fermentation. So we know when it's higher temperature, the, the ter fermentation can get faster. But the thing is, this can also be controlled by the salt. So the, through the years, burro makers in Kandaba have already learned the role of salt, though they cannot explain it in scientific terms. They have this knowledge that they could adjust the salt according to like what ingredients they have or what the, what the environment is but then it's not common in the discourse to talk about the the environment like is it getting hotter or what it, most most of the time they just talk about the fish and the stinky hands and the, the smell okay and then um i am not so sure about the the materials for the tapayan i i don't really i have not got uh, i have not been able to um ask that yet and yeah, yeah, definitely I wanted to learn more about the tapayans, where they're coming from. Uh, I, I know of tapayans in, in um, San Fernando coming from vegan, and uh, they're not getting them from other places, so I don't know if it's the same case here. Are the so the tapayans are not being used anymore, but they're still there? Uh, they are kept for sentimental reasons. But then, but then a lot are also get you know broken for, uh, mm -hmm. accidentally. They say it's the baha, the flood actually makes mm -hmm. them float, and then they clash into each other and they break. Yep. So and and of course these are family heirlooms, and but of course there's also this being sold to to other people, collectors, just like their big houses have been sold already, like to what is that resort in Bataan, Las Islas, Asocarera, whatever, Casas, whatever. Okay. The, but isn't there also, oh, but that maybe I was thinking about Porak, the little Boracay. Okay. Um, there's Margaret Magat asked, uh, said that great work, Melanie, who is doing the distinction practice among Kapampangans, the elders who have achieved stability and respected, or is it the masses of people from below that is driving that distinction of Buro having to have more additions? Hmm. Okay. You know what, this is something that I really want to dig deeper into, like um, right now I just have the, you know, general kind of uh, picture and then I'm going to dig deeper into like the age groups, the gender, etc. But my observation so far is among the elders, the discourse is more on they want the, the life before. They, they like it when it was more simple. And so they don't have to really put all these different ingredients together. They would rather just have santol and rice together. Not much of these flavorings. There is also this part of the population that doesn't like these um, preservatives because they feel it's chemical. And, you know, it, you hear it also, like when they talk about rice, they don't like the chemicals brought about by the modern rice varieties. So, yeah, um, uh, that's as far as I would go in answering that question. And I think that this is a very difficult question as well because it comes at the end of your uh, mm -hmm. study, I would suppose. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of uh, question, uh, comments about uh, Claude Diag serves burro on top of crackers just like cheese and crackers. So uh, has there been changes in how burro art is being uh, 
distributed or uh, paired with other food or is there more resistance when it comes to it in your experience probably mm -hmm. normally they they just want to eat it as a condiment if uh, well if they don't have a choice they would as mentioned earlier they would eat it as ulam viand and um, there are some people who are using it in not so common ways like pinagpapapak which is uh, for for foreign listeners this is more of just eating it by itself and to a filipino this is uh, you know this is not normally how you should do it because you have to eat it with something else like rice for example or with fish okay and then there are some people who i heard has have been putting it in sandwiches making it a filling so we could hear all these different uh, ways of doing it. Yep, and um, I just want to share this. It's I think it's very important. It's not totally totally related there, but before I I don't know like how much time we have, but I just wanted to share also because we're talking about the changes of buro through time. You know what? Um, there have been these recipes, and I've heard these people using. Well, following recipes of buro making using nor sinigang mix, so there's no fermentation there, or even vinegar. And but this is not common in Kandaba. I only heard one person who talked about adding vinegar to to the buro when it's not sour yet. And yeah, which is to me, I mean, if this is the trajectory we're going to, this is really going to be sad because we're going to lose the fermentation. I just wanted to say it. I mean, since we're talking about all these different changes, that's a very important one that I don't want to miss talking about. What was the reaction of the people or or were there when they, when they learned about the nor the mixing with nor? Well, uh, this one I have not really uh, talked about yet with the people here yeah but that would be okay. interesting to know yes. yep but um, but you know what oh uh, maybe for the older i'm just thinking out loud here maybe for the older people it will not be something really good they won't yes. like it but for the younger people maybe they won't care because they don't even know how buro is made i mean uh, they don't even know how to to clean fish or what i mean uh, the, there's this also very uh, loud conversations on kids not engage in this ah, matter okay. and so we are actually anticipating that there will be this kind of uh, gap sure. i mean yeah okay. right but the of course there's going if there's going to be a gap there will always be some uh opinions for people that you know we're still going to eat it this Buro made from you using nor anyway, mm -hmm. pero you know, I, I guess a lot of people also experience this. Then when you're eating, sara pero hindi kasing sarap ng gawa ni nanay or naalala ko. Mm -hmm. So there's also the memories. So while mm -hmm. you're uh, eating, and maybe this also affects how 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 they memor how they memorialize. Mm -hmm. food and methods of food making so then uh -huh. maybe there will always be a shift because the, uh, right now what we're, I'm seeing in probably in the pandemic and I don't know if this is going to be part of your something that you might also look at is that a lot of people have the time mm -hmm. I guess to uh, experiment with food so maybe it I don't know, maybe it could have affected how the people now are practicing food making or maybe they they also look at the traditional food making now that there there is time to work on it. So it's, mm -hmm. I don't know, it's something, I, mm -hmm. I was just thinking at the top of my head. Mm -hmm. You you did mention that, so if, well, the people would still be able to discern, right, the, the taste of the real buro, even if they actually um, try or, or keep on using nor sinigang mix, for example, or other non-fermented options or additions. But that's what I'm hoping, but maybe not, because uh, this is what I see in sinigang. So some a lot of people are already very fond of the sinigang made of sinigang mix. 
they do not like the sinigang, the real sinigang or the sinigang with the kamat, uh, well, kamyas for, for us or some palo or other, other souring ingredients. That is what I'm seeing. Though, of course, I'm not doing, I didn't do a large-scale study on this, but that's what I've been seeing. And I've, I've been hoping, I'm hoping that migrants or people who have been out for a while would be able to discern more. Because maybe because when you're out of a place for a while, maybe you could sense the changes more, just as probably you experience when you've been out of the world, uh, out of the world, out of the country for a while. But yeah, I mean, still so many things to figure out. Yeah. But taste is plastic. We should not forget that. We, we our, our taste changes. It adapts. We have acquired taste, right? Yes. That's a, that's a good point. Um, che Prudente said that it might be important to put conscious effort to popularize burro to more Filipinos. So many of us are into buying commercial products to care for our health, but we're not even sure how much live beneficial organisms are still there. Um, mm -hmm. And John Pasamonte. Do you want to comment on that? Uh, yes, if you... Okay, I, I, I have mixed emotions about that. I do totally understand the, the sentiment of uh, Mam Prudente. She's actually a big person in food heritage, if you recognize her. Feliz Prudente Santa Maria. Hi, hey, thank you for coming. Um, but we, we, I would encourage, I would like to encourage more people to draw from what they have in their own places. Because we have also seen horror stories of foods that are popularized. Once they're popularized, they lose, they lose it. <laughs> uh, it's also part of that discourse on heritageization. So once it becomes heritage, one of the things that could possibly happen to it, it is commodified. It is, it won't be the same anymore. And large, uh, making it large scale or mainstream is uh, something that I'm struggling with. But these are just my thoughts. But I totally understand where she's coming from. Of course, totally. And, and totally know that it could be beneficial. But again, we have to be careful to, if we're going to educate people, we also have to educate that not all buro is the same as we are seeing from this story. And I guess, uh... Uh, this is also something that a lot of people talk about when it comes to uh, material culture. That culture uh, and even culture, it's always changing. So you also mentioned that taste is plastic. So there will always uh, environments change and perspective shift, uh, tastes change. So this might also be affecting it. And as anthropologists, it's our uh, work to to look at that and to see mm -hmm. how how it's changing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I'm seeing a comment of uh, a Dr. Eusebio here. She's saying probably mainstream food products in their respective places, which is something worth considering. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, John Pasamonte asks, how does change in the way we make food actually affect our lives? Or how can this make our lives better? Do you see a trend in trying to make our food, especially Kapampangan food, healthier? And is this a good or a must trend? Huh, that's a very difficult question. <laughs> yes, certainly. I could answer the first question. How does change in the way we make food actually affect our lives? It changes us a lot because we have to understand that food, as we have seen in this presentation, is not just nutrients. It is a lot of things to us. It means security. Like, you know, think about comfort food. Think about like people from Kandaba. And I've heard this from other uh, people, experts as well, talking about rice really being this food security uh, metaphor, symbol. So for example, if they're already running out of the rice in that container, that already means to them pagkalam ng sikmura. Well, I heard that from somebody else. And here, um, they didn't say that, but they also have the same, uh, they, they're also alarmed. Okay, so definitely it affects us. Uh, or maybe, yeah, maybe I don't have to give more examples. And then, or how can this make our lives better? Do you see a trend in trying to make our food, food healthier? Uh, okay, if we change our food, and um, prob um, there are different ways we could change our food. And yes, definitely it can make our lives better. Well, there is that livelihood part where I've seen that in, in, in here in Tandaba, where buro has really been used 
uh, as a livelihood, uh, what do you call this? It's their currency. I mean, this is how they were able to send their kids to school. This is how they finish school. But then when they finish school, they, they stop <laughs> making buro. And that is another factor to, to consider because it is just something that is tied up to a lot of people who don't have money. Okay, and um, how can this make our life better? A lot of other things. Okay, this is probably one of the things I really advocate a lot. Uh, we are living in a time where we have to really promote sustainable diets because we are running out of our resources. The problem is we're getting, we're eating more, we're getting more obese, we're, we're just, in, and it's so hard to reduce our food consumption. This is what I'm thinking. Maybe, maybe, if we change our food so that it goes back to food that stays with us for a while, food that will not flee, I mean, it, it won't change like every two years when a new variety comes, you, you just discard the other variety. I would rather have the food that would stay, stay longer so that you could create a relationship with it, attachment to it, and then maybe one day when you eat, your bibingka, you will savor it more because your lola made this for you years back. And you will not, you will not eat it like a voracious animal, but more of like, hmm, so good. You savor it up to the last bite and that will slow you down and probably that will increase your satiety and that will make you eat less and make you healthier. So many ways on how I think it can make our lives better. Do you see a trend in trying to make our food, especially Kapampangan food, healthier? I'm not very um, much out there at the moment to see all these things happening, but Kapampangas normally like their food really <laughs> very rich. And that is really very hard to, to, to change. So when, when you make some dietary modifications, and I hear this a lot, being a nutritionist, they would always say it's not good anymore. Like hospital food is not good. Food um, prescribed by dietitians is not good because it doesn't have those you know, normal things that you enjoy, fat, salt, sugar. So yes, I don't, I'm, I'm not really very familiar with what is happening, like what movements there are out there. But it's a really very hard thing to do. It really takes a lot of changing of the mindset. Taste this plastic. That's one thing that we should keep in mind. Yes. Um, there's another question here by uh, Jules Alejandre. Uh, interesting and great work. In for, uh, but for, is ferment, fermentation has been associated to foodscapes in most East and Southeast Asian countries. Uh, do you think this has been a shared or influenced food tradition in this region? And I guess uh, Dr. Michelle Eusebio might also be able to uh, join in this question, mm -hmm. considering mm -hmm. that it's regarding the past and interactions. Um, mm -hmm. But well, for you, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. go ahead, go ahead. Ah, no, uh, you, Miss Melanie. Okay, definitely, it is something that we share with our other neighbors in Southeast Asia, not just Southeast Asia, but also in other parts of Asia. So the the what is actually documented or what is thought to be the, the center or like where this buro started is in Cambodia. And the other, other Southeast Asian countries have it, but it, it comes with different names. And of course, it, is, it comes with different nuances. Japan has it or had it. Uh, there are just, well, I'm basing this on a research by Ishige and there's another author. But uh, there has been a lot of, uh, it has been doing a disappearing act. As I mentioned earlier, sushi is ferment, was fermented before. It's called nare sushi. But then there are only a few who are making that in Japan, also in China. And I, I think Korea also has it. Uh, okay, so the other names are shokara, I think. And well, I forgot the others. But definitely, definitely we have a lot of people making it. But I don't know for how long. But the term buro, where does it come from? The, it's... You know, I don't really know. Um, Indonesia, I, I'm trying to recall, I think I saw a similar word, bulo, or I'm, I'm maybe mixing things up. Mm -hmm. But it sounds like something, or, or it is spelled like something else, but I just couldn't um, share it with you at the moment. I'm, 
the process of um, fermentation, so the, the words that they are using for fermenting in uh, the process of making buro, uh, is it also shared or is there some similarities with other Austronesian words? You know what? I that I do not know. Maybe Dr. Eusebio has uh, more to share about that. I I wish I could go deeper ah. there. All right. But uh, in terms of processes, because I've seen uh, the work of Ishige, he did a great they they did a great job of like comparing like what are these terminologies for buro across different countries, but uh, not to the extent of uh, describing or um, stating the different uh, names. Or for the terms used in processing. All right. Uh, I think Dr. Michelle's internet is not uh, working so much, but she mm -hmm. PM'd me saying that fermentation is actually global, lots of fermented products across the world, but are united with the umami taste. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, for Jack, and tomato ketchup is a fermented product, according to Michelle. So it makes it, I, I mean, um, the concept, I, I just like to say to some people here uh, that fermentation, as uh, the speaker said earlier, it's a method to preserve food. So for a lot of people, remember that way before there was no, uh, no refrigerator, I think that maybe this is a method that is shared all across the world because mm -hmm. there is no, because of the lack of uh, food preservation. Mm -hmm. So even if there is something that is shared, we have to look beyond the, the, the functional, the functionality of doing this, this uh, preservation method. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that's why uh, we can look at the materials, the, the, the methods in which it mm -hmm. was being made is the, uh, as Ms. Uh, mentioned earlier, the chain of it. Uh, we can look at the similarities of the uh, the materials that are being used, the words uh, for understanding or to see connections. Um, and we don't have to force it. If there's nothing, then there's nothing. It just. But it's interesting that there are different types. And even if there's no connection in the method of making. Uh, I think what's interesting is that there's also this concept of taste that you were saying, Miss Melanie, earlier. This can be the the hype. What was that term? Hyper uh, hyper sensory or hyper hyperesthetization. I was also trying it out earlier when I, when you mentioned. It's so hard. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> so, we haven't. We all we. It's, there's a lot of letters to it. I apologize. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. So, uh, but this is something that uh, the concept of it is shared. And then, if you go around and travel, maybe, or you try different uh, food, you can see that maybe there's a similarities for the food that you are trying, even if they were not um, associated with each other. So, this is why maybe food becomes asso associated to identity and relationships mm -hmm. the way that you were mentioning earlier. Because um, when you say buro, immediately the first thing that comes into mind is Kapampangan. It's not Pisaya, it's not Tagamindanao, it's not, it's not even the neighboring region of Pampanga. It's just really mm -hmm. Pampanga. So it's already associated to an identity, mm -hmm. if, uh, if I'm not correct, if I'm correct. But if there was something that was happening in this method of making buro was being shared in other places, why is it? Why has it become so entrenched in Kapampangan identity right now? Or do you have an idea or why it became part of Kapampangan identity? Well, one of the things that we have to consider first is how it started. So mm -hmm. we have the resources and so, and then came the livelihood part where people have to use it to have money and they started selling it everywhere. Uh -huh. Buro that I actually, uh, buro makers uh, at a commercial level, I hear them selling their 
burro everywhere. You could not imagine where their burro is reaching. And then I'm also surprised like how many people outside Pampanga are eating burro. And I guess this is this help. This help in putting Kandaba in the map. Like it's very popular for burro, melons, and what's the other one? Birds, the migratory birds. Uh, unfortunately, the melons are not there anymore. Migratory birds are not so much anymore. And I don't know about burro, but yeah. So the livelihood part, like people bringing it out to the different places, selling it has been, has has helped a lot. And um, and you would hear a lot to people, like when you say, ah, oh, okay, we're, oh, okay, when they, when they sell it, they would say it's burro. They, they, it, they would say if it's from Kandaba, then it's really the real burro. It's, so it has developed really into a place thing like a, what do you call this, like Vidalia onions, like champagne. I mean, when it's burro, it's Kandaba. But of course, everybody else can make make burro. In fact, some Lakambat Candabenos make burro in other countries whenever they go there. Whenever, of course, if they know how to. Or others don't know, but they just try and they, they make yeah. it. Um, I guess there's still some questions and actually there's still a lot of people in chatting. Uh, however, uh, it's already 2.30, so I guess I will have to formally end this talk and stop the recording. I, I will, we will be editing this uh, video a bit, just a bit, and then we'll be uploading it to YouTube and we will post it in our Binalo Talks, the link in our Binalo Talks or yeah. uh, Facebook, or you can uh, subscribe to the Archaeological Studies Program uh, YouTube page. Uh, you, you can just look for it. Uh, mm -hmm. So, but if people still want to stay and ask questions. Uh, I guess, is it possible, for Miss Melanie, if they can email you? Sure. Yeah. Uh, yes, please um, email me or you could actually um, send a private, private message on Facebook or, or maybe, maybe just uh, I'll put it on my wall so I mean, everybody else will just see and it's ah, okay. ah, yes. the discussion. All right. Yes, so. I mean, I love talking about food.